Ladies and gentlemen, dear guests, and especially dear Raghu, dear Otmar Ising, good morning to everybody. It's a particular honor and pleasure to welcome you to the joint lecture of the Research Center SAFE, the Center of Financial Studies, and the Deutsche Bundesbank. Our speaker, Raghu Rajan, brings with him an outstanding reputation as a central banker, economic policymaker, and academic. What lends his contributions their particular value is the fact that Raghu is a cross-border commuter par excellence between the academic community and the political arena. And I'm very glad that he accepted to be with us this morning after having already spent the entire weekend with me in Basel, where you, Raghu, have been elected vice chairman of the BIS. So again, congratulations. Since 1995, Rago has been professor of finance at the University of Chicago. He took a leave of absence in 2013 to become the governor of the Reserve Bank of India. But even when he was young, he already enjoyed a distinguished academic reputation. In 2003, he was awarded the American Finance Association's inaugural Fisher Black Prize for the best finance researcher under the age of 40. And before becoming governor of the Indian Central Bank, Raghu had already tested his academic insights in the real world. From 2003 to 2006, he was chief economist and director of research at the International Monetary Fund. And again, you were the youngest person ever to hold this position, Raghu. While at the IMF, Raghu embarked on integrating financial sector issues into the IMF's economic country models, which were mainly built by macroeconomists. And to some extent, this reflects his discontent at what he sees as the excessive fragmentation of the economics profession. He would like economists to be good general practitioners, and he would like to see economists develop models that do not assume away crucial aspects such as the financial sector. However, this mission is not yet accomplished. The IMF and hundreds of academics are still working on this task, and this is also representing some of our main research efforts at the Bundesbank. During his time at the IMF in 2005, Rago presented a paper at the annual Jackson Hole Conference, one of the main annual meetings of central bankers and other high-powered economists, and this paper was titled, Has Financial Development made the world riskier? A question to which most participants at the time probably replied no. Rago, however, exposed the dangers lurking in the financial system and concluded that, yes, financial development has made the world riskier. And this was painfully borne out just two years later in 2007, the years the financial crisis broke out. In his incisive work, Raghu has shown that the risk appetite of banks increase if central banks implicitly promise to respond to an economic crisis by cutting interest rates and providing nearly unlimited liquidity. Consequently, he has continued to warn about the dangers of a monetary policy that is too loose for too long. And he argues that central banks' mandates should be revised to include financial stability as an explicit objective alongside with price stability. Perhaps, Raghu, I would not go quite that far. However, I do agree that monetary policy bears responsibility for implied risk to financial stability if they affect the long-run outlook for price stability or our capacity to ensure price stability in the future. And in that sense, I share your concerns regarding a monetary policy that is too loose for too long. Those who have worked closely with Rago have confirmed that there's one mission he has always pursued, and that is to make the world a better place. Rago has always applied academic insights to economic policy making as chief economist of the IMF and also in various advisory posts in Indian politics. It might well have been against this broad background of experience that he concluded some months ago, and I quote, 
It's not just economics, but the political layer that is imposed over it that determines outcomes. And the political layer is much less well understood than economics. Rago gained even more opportunity to shape the real world in September 2013, when he became governor of the Reserve Bank of India. At that time, India was facing its worst crisis of confidence in two decades. And yet again, by charting new territory and embarking on new strategic paths, he created the conditions for a restoration of investors' confidence in India. He halted the rupee slide by shifting the monetary policy focus clearly towards price stability by means of a glide path towards lower inflation and supported by falling energy prices, Rago has managed to bring down inflation from more than 10% in 2013 to its current level of 4.4%. Despite this strong decline, however, short-term inflation expectations have remained relatively high, indicating that anchoring inflation at that low level remains a challenge, similar to those challenges faced by many other countries with a disinflationary monetary policy. Rago also asserted the independence and credibility of the Reserve Bank of India, both of which are cornerstones of a stability-oriented monetary policy. He also set out to liberalize, develop, and deepen India's financial sector and to enhance competition, knowing that a more developed financial system helps also economic growth. And last but not least, he has promoted financial inclusion, which was one of the subjects over our joint weekend, with regard to small and medium-sized enterprises, the unorganized sector, and the poor. All this has helped to bring an end to India's financial crisis. And, Rago, it has earned you two Central Banker of the Year's award. Personally, I have always experienced Rago as a very inspirational force in the central bank community. Rago, this is due to your impressive resume as an academic, as an economic policy consultant, and the central banker. With regard to the role of central banks in the financial crisis, you once said central bankers enjoy the popularity of rock stars. We are both aware that this attribute does not necessarily make it easier for us central bankers to do our job, which is to ensure price stability. However, here in Frankfurt today, we have set up a stage for you. As it befits a central banker, you are going to give a spoken word performance on the rules of the game in the global financial system. So I'm very much looking forward to that and will now hand over to Otmar Singh. Thank you very much for your attention. It is my pleasure to also welcome you to this event, and it's a special honor to give this short address in the presence of two rock stars of monetary policy, and by chance, the youngest persons ever in both institutions being at the top. President Weidmann has given already a short list of the achievements of Raghu Rajan, and if you look into this in his CV and in his publications, I can only say a lot is left. So I will concentrate only on two aspects. One is, uh, I was present at Jackson Hole when Raghu Rajan gave this remarkable, insightful speech. And I must say I was astonished, even shocked, how little his concerns, our concerns were share, shared, especially among, uh, should I say, Anglo-Saxon central bankers and uh, economists. For me, it was more difficult to keep up his speed while hiking than to grasp the importance of his message uh, presented at this occasion. So uh, it's not so long ago that uh, first we had invited Raghu Rajan uh, to present his book on fault lines, which got a lot of attention worldwide. 
And in 2013, he was awarded the Deutsche Bank Prize for uh, financial economics. And from the Laudatio, I mentioned just two sentences. Uh, his work spans a remarkably broad range of areas in financial economics most important to the development of economics worldwide, ranging from the central role of banks creating liquidity and the role of finance in economic growth to the nature of corporations and their financing. I should stop here to give you the floor. We are very interested to uh, listen to your speech. Thank you very much, uh, President Weidman, um, Professor Ising, uh, distinguished guests, uh, and in that I include the large number of students. It's, uh, it's a great honor to come here and speak to you. Um, I was here uh, a couple of years ago uh, giving a talk on the um, after I got the Deutsche Bank Prize. And, uh, you know, as I was preparing this talk, I suddenly said, you know, the world doesn't change so much in two years. What is it new that I'm going to say to the audience, some of whom may have heard the previous talk? Um, but in fact, the world has changed quite a bit. And, uh, and what I want to talk to you today about is uh, is the global economy, which I don't think we understand very well, uh, uh, the major forces, uh, but also the pressures uh, that are that are arising in this in this um, in this situation. And, and I want to talk about whether it's time uh, for us to think about new rules of the game, and uh, it will imply uh, sort of going a little beyond the traditional mandate of central bankers and speculate about what a, a, a new political arrangement might be on monetary policy across the world. That's why new rules of the game is going to be uh, an important issue. Um, so let me start by, uh, by sort of broadly outlining what I'm going to speak on. Uh, first, uh, again and again we're seeing global organizations come up with lower and lower estimates of growth. Today, I, I think yesterday, the OECD lowered its estimates for growth. The IMF has been doing it for some time. And so I think it's, it's fair to say that seven years after the crisis, we still haven't really got out. And, uh, and um, growth is slow for a variety of reasons which we can come to. Now, at the same time as growth is slow, Within countries, there's tremendous political pressure for more growth, and I'll talk about some of the reasons why uh, this, uh, uh, this is there, uh, perhaps even uh, different from the ordinary pressures for more growth. Uh, and, and this is true of developed countries, it's true of emerging markets. And in this kind of environment, I think there is enormous pressure on central banks to produce that growth. And I will argue that to some extent the mandate of central banks prevents them from throwing up their hands and saying we've done what we could. Uh, and in fact, they have to willy-nilly say yes, we can. Yes, we can. And my worry is that as we uh, sort of ramp up to do more in an environment where in effect we may be able to do less, uh, the damaging effects tend to build up over time. And, and that leads to the question, uh, can we do better? And, and that's where I'm going to talk about potentially the need for discussing at least uh, new rules of the game, because in our attempt, given our mandate to try and fulfill it, uh, we may be creating uh, significantly more problems for the future. And all this will be couched in a little bit of a, um, 
environment where I'm not going to assert anything very strongly because I don't think we really understand the environment that well. And so I want to admit of other possibilities than the one I'll put forward to you, but I will argue that uh, certainly uh, it's useful to think about the consequences. Um, so let me start first with you know, speculation on why industrial country growth is slow, right? Uh, and obviously we have slowed post-crisis from the tremendous four or five years of global growth we had pre-crisis. And uh, uh, one uh, question is, was that growth pre-crisis sustainable? How much of it was, uh, was held up by enormous increases in leverage, which are hard to repeat once again? But post-crisis, this, this may have been further attenuated by the deleveraging that a number of countries are undertaking uh, and, and the consequences uh, of debt overhang. Two different things, deleveraging, bringing down debt, debt overhang, the fact that those who are indebted can't spend as they were spending before or don't have the same appetite for making investments as they had before. And, and this is across a range of, uh, of entities. Uh, which entity matters differs across countries. Some countries, it's households. Some other countries, it's, it's corporations. And yet other countries, it's governments. Now, often the answer to significant debt buildups are debt write-offs. Uh, I mean, in the pristine, pure world of economics, uh, you know, just write it off. World is better off because you grow faster, and the costs of the write-off can be repaid to the, to the guys uh, who held the debt, uh, or at least um, some of it can be repaid. It doesn't work that well in the real world. As we know, there are uh, great political difficulties in writing off debt even within countries, let alone across countries. So we've, we've, we've already moved into the world of, uh, of second best, if you thought that, that debt was the big issue. Uh, and in this world of second best, we've been trying different remedies. The first remedy post-crisis was enormous fiscal stimulus packages across countries, even by countries such as my own, which probably didn't need it and couldn't quite afford the size of the stimulus that, that we did. But nevertheless, across the world, we did fiscal stimulus for some time. And after a while, I think it started petering off, sometimes because we reached the limits of what we could do in terms of uh, debt capacity. A um, number of countries had little fiscal space. But a number of countries also found that fiscal stimulus was, was easier said than done. That, uh, for example, uh, in the United States, they proposed building high-speed rail as one of the answers to the, fiscal, uh, to the financial crisis. High-speed rail was something which stirred people's imagination would involve enormous capital investment and uh, you know, was something that they thought they probably needed. But to date, I don't see any high-speed rail having taken off in the United States, partly because it's easy to imagine, but then once you start thinking about it in practical terms, whether it's going to do any good, where it's going to be, et cetera, it becomes much more difficult to implement. You know, one of the things about high-speed rail, for example, is it's very useful in connecting two very populated cities. But you can't put any stops in between. But first, finding two very populated cities is, is difficult. The high-speed rail in connecting two cities in Minnesota is not going to work. There are not very many people there. And second, when you connect, want to connect Los Angeles and San Francisco, which is probably a good place to connect, uh, there's a political demand for a lot of stops along the way. And once you put a lot of stops in high-speed rail, it stops being high-speed rail. It becomes commuter rail, which we have plenty of. The point I'm trying to make is, is grand infrastructure projects are harder to conceptualize in, uh, in industrial countries and, uh, and typically harder to implement. And I think it's not just austerity uh, because of rising levels of debt, et cetera, which has kicked in. It's also that you know, spending money efficiently in a big way is, is, is really hard, especially when you're thinking about investment, infrastructure investment in industrial countries. Of course, in, in emerging markets, we have plenty of room for infrastructure investment, uh, and there, there are other, other impediments. So fiscal is, is difficult beyond a certain point. Um, 
which means then, um, you know, uh, there is a sense that something else, uh, such as monetary policy, should be used. And the argument here uh, has been that, you know, the real uh, neutral rate is really low. And so what we should do is chase after that real neutral rate with more and more accommodative policy. And that would, uh, real neutral rate being low, broadly means that savings are too high, investment is too low, reduce the interest rate, savings will fall, investment will pick up, and you'll get some e equilibrating in the economy, you get more demand from consumption and investment. So this is the, the sort of uh, idea that has impelled, I mean, broadly speaking, and with due apologies to uh, Otmar and Jens, uh, but this has sort of impelled uh, the ultra-accommodative monetary policies uh, with the idea that even if we have the zero lower bound, let's try and go below it if, in fact, the real neutral rate is, is really low to try and chase after that real neutral rate. But there is a sense in which, you know, we've had seven years of very accommodative monetary policy, but we haven't seen savings rates fall considerably post-crisis. Uh, they seem to be broadly where they were. What has fallen is investment rates, which seems strange because investment rates should pick up with such low interest rates. Everybody's saying money is free. Go out and borrow and invest. But that doesn't seem to be impelling corporations to make massive investments or even governments to make massive investments. Which, which leads to the, the thought that, you know, there are two possible explanations. Um, perhaps the slowdown is, is more structural. We need to figure out what are the impediments and, and, and fix them. And conversely, the pre-crisis levels of growth were perhaps too high and unsustainable uh, fueled by non-inflationary borrowing, and to some extent, that is the BIS view that, that we hear often. Um, so th the real question we need to ask is, what's really going on in the world? Why is it that despite such low interest rates, investment hasn't really, really picked up? Uh, and uh, why haven't savings fallen with such low interest rates? So here are some, some thoughts that I, I just uh, um, uh, hand out because uh, it's not clear that we know. Uh, one possibility is that uh, aging or the prospect of aging is reducing demand. In aging societies, uh, you may be less impelled to invest uh, given that you, find, you, you feel that, uh, that overall demand is going to fall at some point as societies age, that's a possibility. We don't fully understand the effects of aging both on savings and investment, so I'm just throwing this out as a possibility. Another possibility that's often talked about in the US is income inequality, that the marginal propensity to consume of the uh, really poor is very high, um, uh, discussion about some of the refugees coming into, the, uh, into Europe is that any money given to them will be spent, and that's, that's true. And so uh, uh, marginal propensity at, at low incomes is very high to consume, and at high incomes, you've bought your yacht, you've bought your uh, uh, airplane, and you're not going to eat more dinner just because you get more money, so it gets saved. So the idea is increasing income inequality uh, could could reduce uh, consumption levels uh, for the same level of income. Uh, and, and therefore, uh, that is an explanation some have postulated for the slower growth. But of course, income inequality is a slow-moving process. It doesn't e explain why post-crisis this has become much more a constraint. Unless, of course, uh, debt was masking some of the effects of inequality by going to the low-income people and they were spending more, a point that, that uh, I've made in, in my book. A third possibility is that um, with the low productivity, which is another thing we don't understand, why productivity is so low, but that might reduce profitability, reduce investment. Uh, and, a, and a final possibility, why stimulus is not, not so effective is the kinds of stimulus we're doing. Uh, for example, with a variety of uh, uh, methods of quantitative easing, we are altering asset prices. Um, 
there may be a thought that this kind of stimulus is not sustainable and will reverse. Uh, the boost in asset prices today will reverse when we raise interest rates eventually. So this kind of stimulus is not sustainable, is reversible, and therefore doesn't really uh, contribute significantly to demand. Um, set of explanations, I don't know which is right. But again, you have other explanations for why savings haven't fallen given such low rates. Uh, perhaps, again, aging coming closer, and the fact that governments increasingly, the promises they've made on social security, etc., look less tenable given the enormous debt they've built up and the enormous demands on them. Um, these then would impel people to increase savings. And if, in fact, asset prices are also distorted, the worry that asset prices may come to earth, uh, the so-called wealth effect may actually go in reverse. You may worry about current levels of wealth and think they're not sustainable, again, increasing savings. It could also be that um, a number of people have suffered wealth shocks as a result of the crisis. Housing shocks in a number of countries because of drop in housing prices. And then people want to save more to build up their nest egg before they retire, especially if they think retirement promises are untenable. And again, here, very low rates, and I know this is a strange argument, but it has been made, very low rates have the opposite effect. Uh, rather than reducing savings, some people who have an end-of-life uh, wealth objective and are largely reliant on coupon clipping for, from fi fixed income assets may in fact increase their savings because they want to generate more income that they can, uh, uh, more investment income that they can save rather than reduce it when, uh, when you reduce interest rates. Broader point here is that it's not clear to me that in, if any of these explanations is right, that sustained monetary easing is moving us closer to equilibrium. Uh, or in other words, is having an effect on increasing investment and reducing savings. And uh, um, I don't want to argue that the neutral rate may in fact be higher rather than lower, but certainly it is possible that we may not be going, uh, that, that the neutral rate may in fact be an elusive objective. So in this kind of environment, what's the answer? And I, I think the answer that, uh, that seems obvious is if we don't understand how to get growth through stimulus, the answer has to be increase growth potential through structural reforms, right? That, that seems the, the obvious answer. And, and here, of course, um, you come up against the fact that years of slow growth create a very difficult political environment. A, a political environment where structural reforms, which have the effect of bringing forward the pain with the gain coming down the line, exactly the wrong kind of thing to implement in a difficult political em environment. Uh, I think nobody could have said it better than Jean-Claude Juncker. We all know what to do, we just don't know how to get elected after we do it. And I, and I think that, uh, that that's an absolutely uh, a perfect statement because it captures the idea that structural reforms often have the upfront pain. And uh, also the identities of those who are going to lose through reforms are perfectly clear, while the identities of those who are going to gain are obscured, uh, they are realized only later. I mean, classic example, taxis in Paris, uh, fighting against Uber, uh, Uber comes in, there are a small number of Uber taxi uh, drivers who like it, lots of existing taxi drivers who don't like it, and those are the guys who vote. Of course, there are potentially a vast number of Uber-like taxi drivers in the future who will prefer uh, you know, driving taxis uh, and having a free life than working in a bakery but those aren't identified yet. They still don't know that they're going to become taxi drivers, and therefore they have no desire to support this movement to allow Uber, and they're somewhat sympathetic towards the taxi drivers who oppose it. So, so political pain is up front, the gain comes down the line, and the people who gain don't really know it, and, and therefore it's hard to get political support. So we sort of know what we need to do, 
but it's too difficult. And so what do we do? Well, one alternative one could think of, and this goes back to Keynes' uh, uh, um, um, essay in, the 19, in 1930 uh, about uh, a future uh, where we would not have to work. Um, Keynes wrote, uh, I'm trying to remember the essay, Economic, uh, economic uh, Consequences for Our Grandchildren, something like that, in which he talked about 100 years from 1930. Remember, middle of the Great Depression. The world is, is, is uh, quivering at this point, and he's not talking about all the difficulties. He's talking about a world of plenty. He says, in um, 100 years, we will have increased incomes four to eight times. And for the first time in history, we can say we've solved the economic problem. Nobody really needs uh, to work very hard or everybody has enough to live well, okay? And so he's talking about the consequences and so on. What's interesting is Keynes in 1930 predicted income growth of four to, six, uh, four to eight times. If you look at US income growth between 1930 and 2015, it's gone up about six times, okay? And another 25% more growth would get you to the eight times, the upper limit of Keynes' range. 25% growth in, in 15 years is not that difficult. So Keynes was right. We have actually increased incomes tremendously. But what Keynes didn't realize or didn't focus on so much was that we might reach this level of income, but still have great angst. Why do we want so much more growth, even though in industrial countries, look around, it's, it's, it's really good if we averaged out incomes in, in Germany or in the United States, plenty for everyone to live well, right? And the real problem is that Keynes didn't talk about the distribution problem. You could reach the level, but how would it be distributed? And that's, um, that's really part of the problem. Distribution over time, distribution across people. So one of the reasons we need growth, we need still more growth, is because we've made promises. Promises to the elderly, which governments cannot really fulfill. Okay? And therefore they need growth to get the revenues, uh, partly because these promises were made in good times. Uh, again, in the United States, in the, in the state that I know well, the state of Illinois, um, successive governments made promises to unions, to uh, government unions, about greater and greater pensions. And there's no hope, absolutely no hope, that Illinois can make those pension payments given the revenues it has today and given the spendings. So uh, a number of uh, entities have made promises in the good years that are only fulfillable if growth is very, very strong, not possible if growth is weak. Um, so government promises, coupled with the debt that it's taken on, uh, make it important to get more, more growth. And again, it's debt often that's owed to one's own people, so it could all be settled, or settled and uh, the people would not be, uh, as, a, as an aggregate, worse off, but there is a distribution issue between those who are owed the promises and those who have to fulfill the promises. And that, that makes it harder to, to, to do the settlement. Second, there are outsiders versus insiders in every society. The young are usually the outsiders. The uh, elderly and the middle-aged are the insiders. And of course, uh, youth unemployment in Europe is a huge uh, issue, issue that some of you may be worrying about, uh, because you know, it's all very well to have high average incomes in the country, but if you're an outsider, you don't get to see that income, and it's important that you get growth so that you get to be part of that employment and, and grow. Um, growing inequality uh, is also a factor. That is, um, again, taking the example of the United States, fewer and fewer middle-class jobs being created, partly a result of globalization, partly a result of technology. And as a result, for any level of growth, the number of good jobs that most of the people want relatively uh, smaller. And so the impetus to create more growth is, is significant so that these jobs can be created. And finally, and this is more a central bank concern, which is that um, if we sort of 
um, um, settle for relatively low growth, uh, it is quite possible we may also be inviting that, uh, that beast of deflation. Uh, and often, uh, growth and deflation, low growth and deflation, are talked about in the same, same light. Uh, come to that in a, in a second. But the worry is that we could go the quote unquote Japanese way. There is a lot of concern that um, because um, of uh, perhaps uh, monetary policy, which will come to, uh, Japan didn't do enough over a long period and therefore got mired in a deflationary environment which further hurt growth. Now, one can talk about the Japanese example, whether that's, that's exactly right, what I just said. And I think there are deep deficiencies in that example. But in a number of countries, the fear of deflation is also prompting a very strong desire for more growth. So uh, just to summarize and then to uh, move to the, uh, the policy issues, uh, underlying growth is low. Uh, and, and in fact, this has moved across the world. It was thought that emerging markets were distant, decoupled from the industrial countries and were growing fast. But we've realized they're part of the same package. That as industrial country growth has slowed, emerging markets, which have relied on exporting to the industrial countries, have also slowed considerably. Across the world, enormous political need for growth. Enormous political need for growth. And we don't really know what to do. How do we generate that growth? And that implies a lot of pressure on the central bankers to try and do something, because unlike the others, central bankers have a mandate. And to give up would be to say, we're willing to break that mandate, and we're willing to go to levels of inflation which break the lower bound. So in this environment, we don't really know what to do. It's a ripe arena for people who say, we know what to do. Uh, and I'm referring here to the populace. Uh, I said populace on the left, populace on the right, they all have the answers. Uh, my definition of populist is, is the guy who has the answer. Uh, who doesn't think about the uh, unintended consequences of policy, which we all worry a lot about, but has a very clear, simple answer uh, to, uh, to deal with the problem. Uh, one example, central banks can finance infrastructure growth, and that will solve the problem, uh, because uh, governments don't need to finance it, central banks can finance it. Now, any central banker will immediately find five different reasons why this can't work, but it's a very easy uh, statement uh, to make uh, quantitative easing uh, for, the, for the masses. Um, so uh, in this environment, uh, with central banks uh, worried about appearing to be out of tools and having a mandate to avoid extremely low levels of inflation as also high inflation, uh, basically need to keep saying, we, we have the tools. We haven't run out of tools. We will do what it takes. And we can continue doing what it takes. And um, this, credit, this kind of statement is necessary to avoid piercing the lower bound and perhaps entering into a more deflationary environment. And so as we hit the zero lower bound, we go to more and more unconventional monetary policies uh, including uh, what, what uh, uh, effectively uh, may primarily have effects on the exchange rate. I'll come to that in a second. Um, the consequences are extremely aggressive monetary policy, which eventually may have tremendous consequences for financial stability and, and may create problems uh, um, not just domestically, uh, but around the world. And let me elaborate on this, this point. Um, you know, uh, what is the allure of unconventional monetary policy? The allure of unconventional monetary policy is, well, it changes asset prices. But even if those asset prices don't have the requisite wealth effect, the idea is you increase asset prices, people feel happier, go out and spend. Even if it doesn't have that wealth effect, it could have other effects, uh, one of the most predominant being that because uh, you've made uh, domestic assets more unattractive in the longer run, uh, it sends money outside and depreciates your exchange rate. And um, if it depreciates your exchange rate, perhaps the exchange rate benefits of these kinds of unconventional monetary policies 
could have a boost to the economy. Um, so even if it doesn't spur much investment, and we haven't seen much effects of these unconventional policies on real investment, it could have an exchange rate effect. Now, unfortunately, exchange rate effects don't seem to have, in the last few years, significant effects on growth. And it's especially going to become weaker if everybody else is doing it. You may try to depreciate your currency, but if somebody else is also depreciating the currency, you can't all depreciate against each other. Uh, and therefore, the net effect may be limited. It's limited in terms of growth, but it could have fairly deleterious effects on financial risk taking because one of the consequences of doing this is it's harder to get out of it. If everybody's doing it, you don't get much benefit from it, but it's a, it's a prisoner's dilemma situation. If you stop doing it, your exchange rate appreciates significantly and you get hurt on the way up if it, makes, if, it, if it gets really strong. So difficulty of staying out, you have to join the others in doing it, uh, limited effect when you're doing it, and big costs of getting out. This is the classic prisoner's dilemma, which means we stay in it for longer than we need to. But if we stay in it longer than we need to, what eventually will happen when we get out is the consequences could be more dramatic. And one of the consequences in the past of ultra-accommodative monetary policy has been credit booms, uh, real estate booms, capital outflows, credit booms elsewhere, real estate booms elsewhere, and eventually difficulties around the world. If you think about it in the larger perspective, and I'll, I'll say this, then come to policy, you could argue that what we've been experiencing over the last 20 years is really a situation of musical crises, where we've all been trying to push the capital flows to one another. Start first with the 1990s, when low interest rates in industrial countries, emerging markets swallowed the capital flows, uh, Mexico, uh, Asia, Brazil, uh, Argentina, Russia. All these countries uh, took the capital in and eventually found that the capital didn't stay and started moving out. And the net effect was crisis after crisis in these countries. Consequence of all this was the emerging market said, no more. We're going to be savers. We're not going to accept that easy capital. When that capital comes in, we're going to build reserves and send it right back. And so in 2004-05, remember Ben Bernanke's speech uh, about the global savings glut. Now the industrial country at the top of the heap, uh, the United States, was saying that, in fact, capital was coming in and creating distortions, including real estate distortions. It was a prescient speech where he talked about the consequences, even for an industrial country, of managing the capital that was being reflected back to the industrial countries. And we know that the uh, crisis of 2007-08 was not unrelated to cross-border capital flows sent by easy monetary policy. And then you had yet another crisis. And this time, once again, industrial countries moved towards greater savings, lower investment. That's, a, that's one of the consequences of the crisis. And as a result, capital has flowed out to the emerging markets. And once again, the emerging markets, instead of pushing it back, increased their investment, swallowed some of it, the big capital investment in China. And perhaps not unrelated, a lot of emerging markets are once again in difficulty. So we've sort of pushed the crisis one, from one place to another. Uh, what's happening in uh, the emerging markets now is just the third leg of the global financial crisis. But the global financial crisis was again the second or third leg of a sequence of crises we've ha been having since the early 1990s. So how do we stop this? How do we get away from these spillover effects which create tremendous problems across the world because of the dynamic relationship between monetary policy and capital flows? We can't get away from the need for growth, so we have to find growth somewhere else. We have to find growth in real investments which are more stable. And of course, what we need to do is look around the world and see where can we invest in a stable way. 
And it seems obvious that we need more infrastructure investment in the emerging markets. And in industrial countries, perhaps one safe place to invest, which we, need, which we know needs to happen, is what Germany is doing, uh, which is more green investment. So by, uh, um, I, I don't want to comment on the, uh, the, the, the importance or, the, uh, or the, the value, but simply by, uh, by saying that you will phase out nuclear energy, you've put the emphasis on other forms of, of green energy to replace it, and that creates the scope for much more investment. And we know, uh, putting nuclear energy aside, we know that we need more green investments in energy in the longer run in order to make this a more sustainable world. And I think more investment in green across the industrial countries may be something that could result in, in long-term long -term investment. So domestic investment, we need to increase. We need to figure out how to do it. But I also think that we should be a little more patient. And, and uh, we need to understand, and this is where I think we need to be a little careful about sustained unconventional monetary policy for long. The distortions get deeper and get harder to reverse. The benefits, I think, typically get smaller and smaller while the costs of continuing get larger. And importantly, the political economy effects tend to start increasing as you stay with a certain kind of monetary policy. A crude way of saying this is monetary policy typically over the cycle benefits savers over one segment and benefits investors over the other segment. So it's typically neutral over the cycle. But if it stays in a particular position for too long a time, one segment starts noticing that it has more problems than the other segment, and you start getting political voices being raised in one fashion or the other. There are different ways of saying this, but, but basically, uh, I think monetary policy then has to be taking sides more, and that is an issue which raises questions about uh, whether the central bank can continue staying independent if, in fact, there's a sense that it is uh, too much in, in one side. Um, so broadly, I think uh, it is important to recognize the costs of unconventional policy and to see if other units can take up uh, more of the uh, 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 action for growth. Of course, it's easier said than done. And um, typically, central banks, because of the mandate, will have to step up. And, and, and so we need to figure out what we need to do. And, and this is where, finally, I want to say rules of the game may help. That is, um, perhaps uh, one should be thinking not just about the consequences of monetary policy domestically, but the consequences internationally. And perhaps from that, we can limit the, the, uh, the burden uh, that is placed on, on monetary policy. Uh, one of the consequences of the uh, unusual monetary policy we've had over time, as I've said, has been international spillovers. And so is there a way that we can agree on what is legitimate monetary policy globally and what is less legitimate? And this is not to say that monetary policy with negative spillovers for other countries should be immediately ruled out. All monetary policy typically has positive spillovers here and negative spillovers there. But policies that have sustained negative spillover effects should come under a stronger lens uh, uh, from international agencies. If I get my growth simply by depreciating my exchange rate and drawing growth from you, and not by creating more investment domestically. That's a policy that needs to be examined much more closely than a policy where I get my growth partly because my exchange rate depreciates, but partly because I'm making major investments which draw some of your, your, your products. But even then, there might be situations where a country is so depressed for such a long time that the only way it can kickstart its economy is by unconventional monetary policy, which has the only effect of depreciating its exchange rate. Perhaps we could allow those policies if the country then promises over time to pay back, that once it gets out of its funk, it will allow its exchange rate to appreciate and thereby draw in the products of other countries and repay, in a sense, the help it has got from other countries. The broader point I'm trying to make is that Rather than say spillover effects 
are good or bad, and these policies are ruled out or those policies are not. We need to think about how these policies can come together to create a better world, okay? And in that, we need to think about what appropriate rules of the game might be. Now, this seems far-fetched. Today, when central banks have domestic mandates and no further, uh, it seems far-fetched to think about a set of policies about what is reasonable and what is not reasonable. But I think over time, because our economies are so much more integrated, and because central bank actions have effects which are large and persistent, we have to think about how these, these policies affect others. And perhaps in doing so, we will get more reasonable domestic policies, but also to some extent protect ourselves from having the entire burden of growth falling on the central banks and getting away from other actors who probably need to step up effort. And finally, I think we need to think about situations like the current one, where more collective action, I'm not saying coordinated, I'm just saying collective, that if we are in a prisoner's dilemma situation where we each fear get, you know, getting out of the ultra-accommodative policy because it'll have a significant effect on the exchange rate, whether some sense that we will move out broadly together, perhaps not at the same time, but in the same direction, uh, could make it easier for the world to exit these ultra-accommodative policies than one where each one determines their, their strategy on their own, and we end up staying low for long for much longer than the, the world needs. I'm going to um, stop here. We could talk about multilateral institutions, global safety nets, and so on. But, but broadly, to, to, uh, uh, to summarize what I've been saying, lots of demand for growth. And it would be great if we could have policies that add to global growth rather than take growth from each other. We don't quite know what those policies are. Or if they, we know what they are, they're too politically difficult to implement. And so we may be lapsing into policies that take growth from each other. And we need to get out of these. The sooner we get out, the better. And to do this, we may need more global, um, again, uh, not so much coordination, but collective action, that we, we collectively realize what is difficult and, and find ways to do it in a way that doesn't hurt anybody uh, significantly. So can we improve collective uh, outcomes? Longer run, can we think about rules of the game on what is allowable on monetary policy so that perhaps we can mitigate the sequence of crises, which I think is not unrelated to monetary action across the world. Let me stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for this uh, really stimulating speech. Governor Rajan uh, is ready to take a number of questions. Um, I think I was looking back uh, to what you said in 2005, 2013, 2015, and you mentioned it at the beginning. Let's say the underlying problem doesn't change so much, but the dimension has uh, Increase and I think the global, it has much more become a global issue. And you have explained uh, quite convincingly uh, that we are, that central banks are in a trap of uh, low interest rates and uh, unconventional measures. And uh, this prisoner's dilemma, uh, we know it from the literature, um, to overcome is extremely difficult. There will be free riders. Uh, question is who will start this process? Leadership is needed. Um, I think these are the questions uh, which uh, you were explicit on that, to remain open, how to manage that. The need, the need I think, is clearly explained, but difficult to implement. Um, 
but uh, I will not give another speech uh, who is asking for the floor. I'm not, yeah, this is working. So thank you very much. That was a very, very inspiring talk I found. So I'm intrigued by the fact that in the middle of your speech, you indicated that there are two solutions out of the current dilemma. One is more growth, and the other would be um, finding a solution to the distribution problem. And then you relatively quickly gave up on solving the distribution problem and said there is no way but to increase growth. So I would just want to hear a little bit more um, why you don't think we could tackle the distribution problem. And it sounded like it's mainly a distrust in politics, that we trust the economic system more than we trust politics. And maybe in this connection, I would have wanted to hear a little bit about the suggestion for a people's quantitative easing, because it might combine stimulating growth with tackling um, inequality. Thank you very much. Um, so, very good question, and, and the answer is I haven't thought enough about it. Uh, uh, I, I am thinking about it, but I don't have uh, uh, easy answers. I'll tell you the, the fundamental problem that, that, that I see, which again, I think Keynes didn't focus uh, 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 so much. By the way, the title, if I recollect, was Economic Prospects for Our Grandchildren. Uh, and and uh, what what uh, Keynes basically in that essay was very against the money motive, and basically said, look, once we solve the economic problem, we can rid get rid of the money motive. We can go to a, uh, a, a environment where we appreciate the arts, appreciate leisure. Uh, it'll be this utopia. But of course, in the background, he had people working. Uh, some people working to keep the economy alive and providing uh, services, maybe a lot of robots, uh, but at least some people would be, would be thinking. But, but even, uh, uh, he said, while we're reaching there, we still have to have the money motive. And uh, 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 so we need to pay people, we need to give incentives. I think even beyond that, uh, because problems will keep coming, uh, so in this utopia where we have plenty, and the only issue is redistribution. I think even there, you can't abandon growth because there will be problems. People will have to think about ways of solving those, 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 those problems. But also on the way there, we have to give people incentives, right? To create the wealth, to create the innovation, to create the productivity that we need. And so um, uh, the immediate answer to the problem of distribution is tax the uh, living daylights out of the rich. Uh, and that's all very well in Piketty's, Piketty's book where the rich are the coupon clippers and, and passive owners of wealth. But if the rich are part of the professional class or of the, of the, um, you know, the um, innovative class, then you are changing the incentives for entrepreneurship. You are changing the incentives for innovation. And obviously you can do some. But doing too much will bring us back into the realm of the 50s and the 60s, where entrepreneurship and innovation perhaps uh, was a little more limited uh, than it has been uh, recently. So if you want a dynamic society, uh, uh, we need to think about cleverer ways of, of, of distribution. And, and my sense is some of it may lie in changing, uh, changing societal values. And that's where I didn't want to get into it because it's very, uh, very touchy-feely at this point. But my sense is over history, we've seen societal values change uh, you know, uh, depending on the underlying situations. And, and uh, there was a time when being a bureaucrat was much more valued than being an a entrepreneur. Uh, certainly in England, being uh, a, a farmer, a, a landowner, was much more valued than being a tradesman, uh, being one of the crass merchant class. Today, of course, being part of the merchant class is much more valued than being uh, a, a, a landowner. So society does change values, and that may then allow for easier distribution of wealth when wealth isn't given that much importance. That's just a conjecture. As you can see, I haven't thought so much about it, but I don't think there are any easy answers to, to redistribution. On the point about people's quantitative easing, essentially it's fiscal financing of the deficit. 
uh, and fiscal financing of the deficit could have enormous consequences to uh, ultimate inflation and so on. Uh, what is important is if we can find good investment projects in the public sector that will yield returns, we should do them. Uh, I, I think that, that is, goes without saying, but of course, if we abandon all fiscal discipline, that will create uh, other problems down the line. That's why uh, I think the uh, QE was a little questionable. Sorry, long answer to a short question. Claire Jones, Financial Times. Um, two questions, if I may. Um, just on your point on the prisoner's dilemma, it now looks as though the US Federal Reserve is going to be the first to head towards the exit. We've, of course, seen the taper tantrum in earlier events where it's looked to shift towards the exit. Do you think we're in a position where the global economy can cope with um, less uh, loose monetary policy from the Fed? And just a second point, if I may, um, it struck me as quite an obvious way to fix some of the problems that you mentioned, such as um, inequality and also low productivity, but be a lot more investment in education and training. I know that's something that you talked about a little bit in your book, Fault Lines. You didn't seem to touch on it today. Is that because you're more pessimistic on that now? Or, well, it would just be good to know your views on that as well. Yeah, well, well first on the second question, yes, uh, in, we need that kind of investment also. Uh, but again, um, it, it's not, it doesn't seem to be just a question of, of, of putting a lot more money into it. Uh, there's a shaping of it, uh, which we need to be much more careful about. Uh, one example is, uh, you know, uh, the pressure in the United States for students to get more education, and partly some of the funding uh, by the government has also resulted in students coming away with high levels of debt, but not having the appropriate skills to get a good living. So uh, it's, a, it's a complicated issue, uh, and we need to figure out how to expand skills, expand education, uh, uh, and that will be part of the answer. But again, it can't be the answer for everyone. Uh, not, not everyone has the same uh, desire uh, aptitude or the capacity at this point, you know, nearing age 45 or 50, uh, to, to reinvent themselves. And so we need to figure out how they uh, sort of participate now that the jobs they were doing have become redundant. So that's, that's on the uh, global preparedness, look, uh, the liftoff has been one of the most widely advertised uh, uh, factors. Of course, over time, uh, different countries come under different uh, political and economic stress. And so not everyone will always be prepared. So there will be difficulties uh, when, uh, when it happens. There will be volatility. Uh, but I, I do think that uh, the warning has been out there for, for quite some time. And uh, I worry more about the consequences of staying in the ultra-accommodative phase across the world uh, than about the, uh, what I believe would may be the more temporary consequences of volatility when we exit. I think there will be volatility, but I think we have to bear it for fear of further and deeper volatility down the line if we don't at some point move out. Uh. Good to see you, Raghu, as always, inspiring talk. Uh, the question that I have, I want to pick your brain a little bit on the politics that you um, alluded to, and it's a follow-up on the earlier question that was asked on this side. Um, you were basically, you talked about how there's political obstacles to some of the necessary changes that need to be made, um, and that the politicians, to some extent, have passed the buck to the central bankers to uh, fix the problem, but that you felt that they have to, politicians, that is, to step up um, and change some of the things, but they're in this difficult conundrum of basically facing an electorate and needing to get reelected and so on. So my question is, do you think that this is essentially a structural problem of democracy that we basically have to face? Or would, do we actually need to think a bit more about the rules of the games and politics and to what extent can we change some of the incentives there? And do you have thoughts on that? 
Um, no, I, as a central bank, I don't want to opine on what <laughs> uh, rules of, uh, of, uh, of politics should be. Uh, but, uh, I mean, in a sense, what I'm, I'm pointing to is, is, is a structural problem, which is that the central bankers have a mandate and can't sort of uh, let the economy's inflation rate fall below the lower bound. And, and as a result, always have to step up to the plate uh, when it is a sort of form of moral hazard. They have to step up to the plate when, uh, when in fact, uh, the solutions may be easier elsewhere. And, and that, I think, creates a reluctance to, uh, or, or less of an incentive to undertake these solutions elsewhere, and more of the burden falls on central bankers. So I'm proposing a roundabout way to push the mandate back uh, so that uh, they have the right incentives. But precisely what they would do, et cetera, uh, and what sort of uh, uh, fixes would be, um, I, don't, I don't have a lot to say on that. But good to see you. So you spoke about this and like a multilateral institution which can actually coordinate central bank policies all over the world. So like do you think if there is an institute which is actually present, maybe IMF or BIS, which can take the initiative and like bring in all the central banks and coordinate on it, or we need a new com new institution with a new mandate to make make such a world possible? You know, I've, I've stopped using the word coordinate because it's, uh, it seems uh, a little too uh, sort of uh, forced, uh, you know, uh, central banks taking orders from a multilateral institution. Instead, I'm more, uh, uh, what I want to suggest is, is policies have to pass a, a sort of uh, rules of the game filter that it should broadly be seen as, as doing good over the long run for the, for the world. Uh, and policies that don't have that aspect should be questioned. I'm not saying any international institution will have the mandate to say, you know, if you do this, uh, uh, thus and such penalties will occur. But I think there should be a sense that these are not quite global citizenship uh, because they fail the, the broad rules that we've agreed upon. So, I would be happy if at first step we agreed on what are, what are reasonable uh, characteristics of, uh, of global citizenship uh, on policy. Uh, and then down the line, I, I think one can talk about uh, possibilities of, uh, of more enforcement than, than peer pressure. But I think even, even one doesn't need to go there. At least let us agree on what's, what's reasonable. I think today we don't, we don't quite have a sense of what's reasonable. Rago, if I may, just one quick provocative question. One of the casualties of ultra-low monetary policy, if not um, at least collateral damage, is the profitability of the financial sector, be it banks or insurance. Is this compatible with central banks being responsible for that monetary policy and for supervision of the large parts of the financial sector? <laughs> I don't know which way you want me to go on that. Uh, um, I, I, I don't think part of the central bank mandate is, is profitability of the, of the banks, uh, but clearly, as you said, uh, it's, it will have an effect on their financial stability if it stays low for long. And so my guess is um, that's a concern that they, they should have uh, about a potential weakening of the financial sector over the long run, but purely from a financial stability perspective rather than directly on the profitability. Thank you. Um, a more general question. Uh, what are your thoughts, or there seems to be a tendency among central bankers and academics to uh, disregard uh, monetary aggregates uh, as a tool or anything important for, uh, yeah, having both of you there, uh, for monetary policy. What are your thoughts on that? Do you agree? Well, 
uh, we actually uh, do take it into account in, in, in our monetary policy setting uh, in the sense that we have a target for the expansion of our balance sheet, uh, the central bank's balance sheet, and, and, and the relationship it has, for example, to um, you know, high power money and so on. And um, so uh, we, do, we do follow it in that sense. Uh, so we have both an interest rate uh, um, sort of uh, uh, s that we set as well as uh, a, a broad target for the uh, desired expansion of the balance sheet over the year. Uh, I almost suspected that I would have uh, asked to, this question to be raised. Uh, it's not true, but you see Germany or Frankfurt is still a place in which such questions might arise. Uh, so uh, I think we have time for one more question, and may I take the opportunity to raise this one? We can do one more after. I, I didn't see it. Uh, sorry. sorry. Uh, hello, my name is Mrdjan Mladjan. Uh, I teach at the EBS Business School nearby, and I recently came back from Mumbai, where I taught a course. And I'm still full of impressions from your beautiful country. So I would like to ask you if you could tell us at least a few words about your current job and about what you see as the future challenges for the economic growth and development of India. Thank you. Okay, I'll, I'll do it in two minutes, three minutes, given your... Uh, Take your time. Uh, you know, uh, this is something obviously I, I didn't talk about much, I should have talked about, but didn't know how to weave it into the talk. You've given me a good opportunity. Um, uh, India is, is what I would call a recovering economy, and, and part of our problem we, was we overstimulated post-crisis, and we had to undo some of that stimulus and get back to macro stability, and that's what we've been doing over the last uh, three, three and a half years. And, and I would say that there's been a fair amount of success in bringing down the inflation rate and bringing down the current account deficit and slowly bringing down the fiscal deficit also with some help, of course, from the international environment. But, but we've, uh, I think we're, we're in a much better place as far as macro stability goes. Now we have to bring back growth in a much stronger way. Growth has been picking up slightly, but there are massive investments that are now being planned, some of which are taking off, roads, uh, highways, um, uh, warehouses, uh, new towns, new cities. Um, you know, investment a la Chinese, if, if, uh, if I may say so, that is big, uh, enormous investments, which will reduce the cost of bu doing business significantly. Uh, so I think we are on the verge of, of really a, a takeoff to much stronger growth. Um, we need to work on four dimensions. Uh, one is this infrastructure build out that I already talked about, which will help manufacturing growth uh, significantly. The second is human capital. India needs many more uh, well-trained people. You encounter a number of uh, Indian students that I see in the audience, but you encounter some of the smartest and well-trained Indians, and somehow, sometimes, the impression goes that this is characteristic of the broad population, but we have uh, a large part of the population which is poorly trained, but is capable of being much better skilled, much better trained. And, and we need more engineers, plumbers, scientists, um, carpenters uh, across the board. And uh, many are thinking of taking a leaf from, uh, from Germany's skill building. Uh, but of course, that's uh, maybe sui generis. We need to think about what aspects we can, we can imbibe, which will be uh, very important. Third aspect is business regulation. We have to make business regulation easier uh, and, and I think the government is working at it very, very strongly to try and, uh, you know, get rid of old laws, simplify new laws, and reduce the cost of doing business. One important aspect of doing business is acquiring land, and uh, increasingly I think the states will set their own pace for land acquisition, which will be a very good thing. Uh, one important new factor in India is the states are competing with each other to create opportunities for growth. And I think that is, that is going to be uh, an ex because each state in India is about the size of a European country, a large European country. Uh, so uh, as a result, uh, I think we're going to get 26, 20, 29 countries competing, 
which will be a good thing. The last aspect is financial sector reform. We've done a lot there. Uh, we have 23 new banks being set up over the next year uh, in, in an environment where, you know, the, we, last time we licensed banks, we licensed two or three in the early 2000s. So 23 new ones are going to change the financial landscape. But lots of other things happening on financial inclusion, 190 million new accounts opened. Uh, direct benefits will be transferred, direct cash, cash transfers to people. Uh, the use of mobiles is expanding tremendously uh, in, uh, in, uh, in the finance. And uh, what is very interesting is these internet marketplaces are just expanding uh, uh, overnight. And that's very important for India because uh, it gives a lot of opportunity for small entrepreneurs to actually access the Indian market, but also it allows small consumers sitting in a small town to actually have access to all the wares that are being produced in India. So this is a, really a game changer. That word is misused a lot, but it is a game changer because these guys are focusing on improving logistics, they're creating enormous warehouses, they're also reaching every part of India, but they're pulling from that poor carpet seller who's sitting in Kashmir making fantastic carpets but doesn't have a market and sees all his profits taken by middlemen. Now he gets a much larger market, not just in India but across the world. So, very interesting thing happening, uh, and what we need to do is implement, implement, implement to make sure that uh, what we promise, we actually do. Sorry, that took longer. No, 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 <laughs> I did not want to cut off. Uh, I was glad that you hesitated two or three times to ask for coordination. But uh, we, we, I think we have not a proper word for what you have in mind because we know the problems of coordination, but a common approach or whatever it is uh, is needed. You um, brought convincing arguments for that. Uh, but before uh, agreeing on policy measures, one has to agree on the diagnosis. And uh, would you say that uh, your assessment of uh, that low interest rates and unconventional multi-policy measures have not brought the hoped results. Negative side effects are building up. Is this assessment already common among central banks in the world? Because this would be the basis for coming to a common approach. And if not, it will continue for a while. Uh, negative side effects uh, you could give your 2005 speech again, uh, will build up again, and uh, if the next crash on asset prices comes, we are in a world with low interest rates, uh, high public debt, uh, and then we have really to run out of tools. Uh, yeah, no, I, I, I do worry that uh, the positive effects um, may have been very early on, uh, but over time uh, they have dissipated. Uh, it's certainly hard to see it in the data that there's a huge impetus to real investment. And, uh, you know, asset price, uh, asset prices are, uh, I mean, the whole intent of some of these policies is to alter at asset prices. And so, obviously, when we, when we move away from these policies, there will be asset price shifts. And so, my worry is the longer we push that, uh, the more problematic it is. Uh, you raise a good point, which is uh, we also out of these tools then at that point, and what tools do we have? Uh, and it may be that uh, at that point, uh, we finally do the, uh, the things that we should have done in the first place. So thank you. Uh, thank you again for joining us uh, to this uh, event. And especially, uh, we are very grateful to you, Raghur, that you came again. And uh, I do hope that uh, in the future you will continue to share your insights uh, with us. It would be a great privilege to have you here again. But for this time, thank you so much for giving this speech and uh, answers. Uh, thank you. Thank you.